had vanished under similar circumstances, though the investigations into these disappearances couldn't have been more different. In the spring of 1995, Stockton, California native Kristen Smart graduates from Lincoln High School and sets her sights on a life filled with new people and new places. Kristen was our family's adventure seeker. Anytime there was an adventure to be had, she was on the page and ready to jump in. She wasn't a follower, she was a leader. She did what she loved, you know, and she was passionate about whatever she did. That fall, Kristen enrolls at Cal Poly State University in San Luis Obispo. What were Kristen's hopes and dreams for the future? Kristen had always been interested in architecture. But in another breath, she might tell you that she wanted to be Joan London and have the opportunity to interview a lot of interesting people and travel the world. No one could tell her that anything was impossible. Even with a heavy course load and a full social calendar, Kristen never forgets to call home. She called home every Sunday night. It wasn't in the cell phone era where you could just do that easily. But she wanted to talk to everybody. The same is true of May 24th, the Friday before Memorial Day. That night, while getting ready to go out, Kristen calls home and leaves a message for her parents. It was before she went out to the party. And the message was, good news, good news, I'll call you Sunday. Kristen offers no further details about her good news, which makes her parents even more excited to talk to her. But Sunday evening comes and goes, and Kristen never calls. On any other Sunday, you would have called, but because it was a long weekend, made the assumption that she would call on Monday. But by noon on Memorial Day, there's still no word from Kristen. That afternoon, her roommate returns from a weekend trip and notices something strange. All of Kristen's personal belongings are there, but Kristen is nowhere to be found. When her roommate starts asking around, she discovers that no one has seen Kristen since Friday. She decides to contact campus police. Later that day, the phone finally rings at the smart household. But it's not the call Kristen's parents have been waiting for. It was a police officer from Cal Poly Police who called to say that they had some concerns about Kristen and had she come home for the weekend. And that's when your mother's instinct kicks in and you say this is not right. It appears Kristen Smart has vanished, but despite her mother's concerns, campus police are reluctant to file a missing persons report or start a formal search for Kristen. The campus police believe that she may have simply taken a holiday and they thought that she was just traveling somewhere. By Tuesday morning, there's still no word from Kristen. So Kristen's father, Stan, makes the 250-mile drive from the Smarts' home in Stockton to the Cal Poly campus. Once there, he persuades campus police to put up missing persons flyers. Officers also began collecting eyewitness accounts from the night Kristen disappeared. Nearly all of them placed Kristen on her way to Fraternity Row. Kristen suggested that they go to one of the fraternity parties. Well, a couple of the girls had a test they needed to study for, and another girl almost went with her but opted out, and they left Kristen at the fraternity house. So she's quite familiar with all of these people, right? She knew people that were going to be there, and she would feel very confident and very comfortable about going there by herself and getting home. Even though Kristen is underage, she has openly served alcohol at the party. I don't know many college students that don't have a drink their freshman year in college, and especially at a frat party. Yeah, most people probably are drinking. Was she a heavy drinker now? But according to eyewitness accounts, by 1 a.m., Kristen is so intoxicated that three of her fellow students had to help her get back to her dorm. Kristen was found in this grass area. Apparently, from this point is where they helped her up and started to walk her back to her dorm. Campus police bring all three students in for questioning. They all tell the same story. 
Shortly after 2 a.m., they dropped Kristen off just a few yards from her dormitory before heading home themselves. And that's the last that anyone's ever seen. Kristen is walking towards their dorm. But it appears Kristen never made it back to her room. Why? With no evidence of foul play on the part of the three students who walked Kristen home, police posed the theory that an intoxicated Kristen may have simply wandered off. But there are no eyewitness reports to confirm that theory. Days pass without a single clue to Kristen's whereabouts. One day goes by, two days go by, before you know it, you have a map up on the wall in the kitchen to where your marking locations of her last been sighted. Not that the smarts are giving up on their crusade to find Kristen. Your heart is broken, but you can't let your will break because you have to be on your toes and you have to look for resources that can help you find your daughter. The Smart's efforts finally start paying off. News of Kristen's disappearance has spread throughout the region, and leads are pouring in. They would get all these reports that she was seen in a drugstore, she was seen in another city. Wherever people said they saw her, my husband was in the car, and he just drove to wherever that was, and it was all over California and Nevada. Has Kristen simply run away? One sighting places her as far away as Canada, but like many others, it turns out to be a case of mistaken identity. If you're a tall blonde, it's either, you know, a curse or a cure because everybody's seen you. The search for Kristen is back to square one. And the smarts are beginning to believe something terrible has happened. What is your initial instinct as to what has transpired to your daughter? Well, something is just not right. She'd been harmed in some way. In San Luis Obispo, California, Cal Poly student Kristen Smart leaves a fraternity party and vanishes without a single sign of struggle or foul play. At the urging of the Smart family, campus police enlist the help of the local district attorney's office. The DA's investigators start by re-examining transcripts from the initial eyewitness interviews. They quickly discover that one of the three fellow partygoers who escorted Kristen home a 19-year-old food science major named Paul Flores actually lingered with Kristen a little longer than her friends. He promised the individual that was walking with him that he was going to get her home safely. This new detail creates a gap in the timeline the night Kristen vanished and means Paul Flores was the last one to see Kristen alive. This raises a huge red flag with investigators and it's not the only one. He had a black eye, he had scratches, which is not particularly compelling unless you're contacted by the police with regard to a disappearance. The investigators grow even more suspicious when they learn many of Paul Flores' fellow students first noticed his injuries the day after Kristen vanished. They also tell investigators that multiple times, Flores changed his story about how he got the injuries. If he got them drunk falling into a bush, why didn't he say, Gosh, I got drunk last night, I fell into a bush. It's the lying about the physical injuries that makes the physical injuries far more compelling. On June 19th, investigators bring Flores in for further questioning and confront him about his injuries. How do we know that everything you filled us so far is really the truth? How do we know now that you lied? Well, 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 that wasn't important though. Sure it is, that's important. Flores now tells investigators that he sustained the injuries when he hit his eye on his steering wheel while installing a car stereo. One aspect of Flores' story that doesn't change is the account of his last moments with Kristen. I walk with her to where the driveway was, and I went off to my dome because the walkway goes that way towards my dome, and then she started walking with that way. Investigators have their doubts. They offer Flores a lie detector test, but he refuses. Still, it's not enough for investigators to charge Flores with any crime. If they go forward without the best possible evidence on a thin or weaker case, and he's acquitted, 
and then he walks for the rest of his life and he can never be tried. You want to have some compelling physical evidence. But processing a 